Hi, I'm Ken Fisher. Welcome to the 15th season of Citywide. All year, our guests are people who make things happen in New York. Our guest on this edition of Citywide is Michael Cardoza, the New York City Corporation Counsel. He's our city's chief legal officer. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here, Ken. Now, chief legal officer, corporation counsel, most people don't think of New York as a, uh, as a corporation, but with 650 lawyers, you head what is arguably one of the largest public interest law firms in the, in the country. Yes. What, does it mean to be the city's lawyer? What do those 650 lawyers do? Well, uh, according to the city charter, uh, we represent every city agency, the, par uh, the police department, Department of Homeless, uh, so uh, Children's Services, as well as the controller, uh, the city council. So when any, whenever anyone gets sued, we defend it. But our job is a lot more than defending lawsuits. Um, we bring a lot of cases on behalf of the city, both to achieve important public policy objectives and to recover money for the city. Uh, we def defend the city's tax base when people don't like uh, the real estate taxes that are assessed upon them. We bring condemnation proceedings. We also do a lot of development work. Uh, the city enters into about four billion dollars worth of contracts a year. Is that billion? That was billion, billion, not billion. million. Uh, and every single contract the city enters into has to be approved by uh, my office. The difficult ones negotiated by my office. We have major environmental matters. As you know, the mayor is uh, a major proponent of making New York a greener uh, place, and we take a lot of initiatives in that area, so we cover a, a wide swath of, uh, of issues. New Deputy Mayor Steve Goldsmith, former mayor of Indianapolis, um, Harvard Kennedy School expert on public policy, uh, now on the job just a few months, has been um, speaking before a lot of civic organizations with a basic message that he is amazed at how the hands of the city are tied uh, either by court orders, many of which go back decades, in some cases legislation or other regulatory rules imposed by the federal government or the, or the state government. How does this affect the work that you do and, and, and is he right that in some ways city government is over -lawyered? not necessarily by your office? Well, I think the, uh, I certainly agree with Steve that we, uh, there's a lot of external uh, rules that impose limitations on the city. Uh, I think you have to take those one at a time. Uh, there's something uh, called consent decrees. These are orders that have the courts have entered over the years that tell the city what they can and cannot do. Um, and these are uh, agreements that were entered into by the city many, many years ago in which the city agrees to do or not to do something. And of course, as time changes, you look back and you say, why did the city ever agree to that? Um, and so one of the things that uh, my office has been trying to do is either modify or end those so-called decrees. So that, that is certainly an Give area. Give us an example of one of those. Well, uh, the, one of the best known ones is the so-called homeless decree uh, that was entered about uh, 30 years ago. Um, when the city's homeless uh, shelter population was a very different uh, set of rules and regulations and the courts entered a series of orders that resulted basically in taking any power away from uh, the homeless commissioner and uh, the state court uh, judge was in charge of the homeless uh, services. And so 
to change the formula that you wanted to uh, have children in a homeless shelter take, if you wanted to take one manufacturer rather than another manufacturer, you had to have court permission to do that. Now, in all due respect to the courts, that's not what they should be doing. Those kind of issues should be decided by the homeless commissioner. And so we're able, after, with a good deal of effort, to end that decree. Uh, there's a decree that was entered in the mid-1970s uh, regulating Rikers Island and, and uh, the physical conditions of Rikers Island, which in the mid-1970s, Rikers Island was not uh, a particularly good place. Um, but that decree still, uh, we still have to operate under that decree 30 years, almost 40 years later, we have to go back to uh, a federal judge who remains in charge of Rikers Island. So those, that's one area that I think Steve was talking about that uh, we have to try to uh, deal with. Let me, let me uh, uh, say that there are some students of New York City history who <coughs> suggest that mayors, uh, not necessarily Mike Bloomberg, but mayors who have complained about the consent decrees actually use them politically. And what I mean by that is, is that whether you're talking about the homeless, or you're talking about inmates, uh, these are disenfranchised uh, populations. Uh, they're also not politically popular. Spending money, uh, particularly in hard times, uh, difficult to do. And there's some speculation that previous mayors entered into consent decrees basically to tie their own hands so that they could then say to the city council and the state legislature, you must appropriate money for this, whether you like it or not, because otherwise we're, you know, we're going to get sued. Well, I've heard that story uh, said. I, I, I don't know, of course, the former mayors. I do know most of the, uh, uh, I know all the living former corporation councils, all of whom uh, were outstanding lawyers. Um, and I think, uh, I think there's two responses to that. One is, in the 1970s, one didn't realize the long-term implications of entering into consent decrees. And to the extent that the city enters into them today, we do our best to have end dates in them so we don't have this, this, uh, this problem. Um, and the other point to recognize is if the city has been found or is about to be found guilty of doing something in violation of the law, uh, the Corporation Council at the time is faced with a hard choice because if you try that case, the judge may enter a permanent injunction and you may be not talking not 30 years but 100 years. Um, so I think, uh, I don't think it's uh, necessarily correct uh, to say the, uh, the politicians just wanted an out because after all, from a philosophic point of view, these decisions should be made by the city council, by the mayor, and by the uh, commissioners and not by a court. Well, let's take a, a current controversy where I guess you didn't take the easy way out, and now the city is, uh, is grappling with the consequences of that uh, litigation over the hiring practices of the fire department. The fire department is a premier organization. Um, you need to have very strong traditions and family ties to um, empower people to run into burning buildings. Uh, so the culture of the department is really critical. Uh, but it is among the most white employment organizations in city government. Um, you've grappled for a while with the tests that firefighters have to take uh, to be able to go on the job. A federal judge sees the world very differently from the way that you do. Tell us about that case, where it stands, and why you and Judge Garifas uh, don't seem to be getting along. Well, uh, certainly we don't agree with some of Judge Garifuss's rulings. I would agree with that. And, and this, is a, this is a very difficult case. Uh, the fire department is the organization that you just described. Um, and uh, it is uh, certainly its present membership is far whiter than one would, would like it to be. And we've been doing the very best we can to try to change that mix. At the, and so what you do for, uh, for any city job um, is you take tests. Uh, now, Judge Garifuss has found, we think incorrectly, but he so far has found that the tests we have applied uh, for new firefighters have a, a discriminate against minorities. And that's what the initial part of this lawsuit uh, has been about. Um, the latest uh, test that Judge Garifuss found to be uh, improper um, 
even though we had re recruited extensively uh, minorities to take this test, this was in 2007, 34 percent of the people who took the test were minority, which in fact is roughly the percentage of minorities in, in New York City uh, that might have been eligible to take the test. And we felt that uh, it did not affect minorities either uh, because of improper questions or in terms of the, the way the tests ended up being scored. Uh, Judge Garifas disagreed with that, and, and at the appropriate time we will be appealing that. Where we have had, uh, unfortunately, some particular disagreements is that Judge Garifas has now said, um, City, you can't hire any firefighters going forward either until you have a new test, which we're obviously working to develop, or unless you have a quota. Um, and we think that's not the way to have the best firefighters in the city of New York. When you uh, want, the, if your building, God forbid, is, is burning down, you want the most highly qualified individual running in to save your family, save your, your apartment, um, and that should be the best person not uh, decided upon the percentage of people, black, white, or what have you. Well, what's going to happen in the short run? If we can't hire more firefighters, there are always going to be retirements, people leaving the, the system. Are we going to, how long is this going to take to resolve? Well, uh, we're developing as rapidly as we can a new test that we hope to be uh, completed uh, uh, in less than a year. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we are forced uh, to pay overtime, um, which is, of course, something that the city can ill afford to do. Uh, right now, but, but uh, the mayor feels very strongly, and I agree with him, uh, that uh, we're not going to hire based upon a quota. And Judge Garifas, who's the judge in charge, and we certainly obey the law, um, has said we can't hire any other way. So until we appeal and either get the decision reversed or to have uh, a new test, that's where we are going to be. We're we'll talking a little bit about um, the, the sort of the nature of the beast, the client that you represent. Uh, when Citywide continues, right after this. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with New York City Corporation Counsel Michael Cardoza, City's Chief Legal Officer. So when you're representing agencies, you don't get to choose your clients. Uh, you can't tell the Department of Homeless Services that they didn't tell you their bill last month or that you're just not interested in the, uh, in the case. Um, is it your role to help them make policy? And what do you do when you have a commissioner who's insisting on taking a position that you think is either legally insupportable or just plain wrong? Well, I think that's a very good question because I view my job not just to be defending the city of New York and the agencies when they're sued, but doing my very best for those lawsuits not to occur. Now, I don't mean to say that every time someone yells and says, hey, it's illegal, that we say, oh, sorry, uh, because frequently people who claim that we're doing something illegal are incorrect. But what I do think is my job is to make sure that commissioners are consulting both with their agency counsels and with me and the rest of the law department to find out if a proposed policy is or is not lawful. Um, and I make no secret of the fact as I tell commissioners, you cannot do that because it is illegal. Now, most things are not black and white, obviously, and so you, then you advise the commissioner, you may, the courts may or may not agree with you, and then you have, the commissioner has to make a judgment whether he wants to roll the dice and go, go with the judge. But um, if the commissioner is going to do something illegal, I tell him or her that cannot occur, and, and it doesn't. What kind of client is Mike Bloomberg? Mike Bloomberg is a terrific client and a very demanding one. Um, he wants the highest and quickest performance, and that's what a good client should want, and is the obligation of a lawyer not to tell the client always, no, you can't do that, but to tell the client, 
don't do it that way, do it this way, and then it will be, be lawful. And he appreciates that distinction a great deal. Um, the great thing, one of the many great things about Mike Bloomberg, he's an extraordinarily quick study. Uh, he understands, you go to him and you say, we have this problem, and I recommend that we do, take this approach. He'll ask a half a dozen questions, and fortunately for me, most of the time, he takes my recommendation. And occasionally, uh, lawyers are wrong. And to the extent that I have given him what turns out to be uh, incorrect prediction of what the law is, or incorrect legal advice, he never looks back. And that uh, he doesn't backbite and say, hey, you told me X, and the judge said uh, not X. Um, and that makes it a, a real pleasure uh, to work for Mike Bloomberg. He's also been an activist mayor in some areas of social policy, um, either pushing through controversial regulations with smoking, trans fat, and the like, but also in terms of using affirmative litigation to highlight public policy issues such as um, guns from out of state being used for the commission of crimes in New York. Tell, tell us about some of those activities. Now, we have a whole uh, group in the office who are in charge of, of affirmative litigation, and they pursue both damage cases as well as so-called policy cases. And let me give you an example on the gun case. I think, as most of your viewers would know, Mike Bloomberg is uh, outspoken in trying to prevent illegal guns from coming into New York City. So what he said to me, in essence, one day a, a number of years ago is, Michael, we've done some studies and we find that a huge number of the guns that end up in crimes in New York City are come from out of state and have been purchased illegally. And so we did some studies and we discovered that a large number of stores in a half a dozen states, uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Carolinas, um, had very uh, lax gun laws and that a large number, and you're able to trace guns because there's a registration inside the gun, we were able to trace where those guns, the stores those guns came from. And this is, I think, a, a good story. Um, we sent a, uh, two investigators, one male and one female, to 27 retail stores in these states the man was wearing a Yankee baseball cap, and he had a video camera inside the cap. And he would go up to the teller and he'd say, I want to buy a gun. The teller would give him the gun, and the teller, because federal law says you have to fill out paperwork, uh, federal, the uh, uh, retailer would say, fill out this paperwork, and the purchaser, would, the male purchaser wearing the Yankee cap would say, oh, my girlfriend will, will <laughs> fill out the paperwork. And that is an absolute violation of law. So we had all that on videotape, and then we brought a lawsuit against those 27 stores, and we brought the lawsuit in federal court in Brooklyn. We said that those sellers were creating a nuisance in New York City. Well, the result of that effort is that 24 of those 27 stores entered into an injunction, consent injunction, in which they're now being supervised by a federal monitor mm. And the gun traffic in those, around those stores has fallen off precipitously. I think that's a pretty good example of using social policy, if you will, using litigation to advance social policy. What happened with the others? Didn't one of them sue the mayor back? Uh, two of them actually uh, uh, brought a lawsuit against both the mayor and his lawyer, who happens to be me. Um, and we've been able successfully to get those cases uh, dismissed. Um, so that's an example. And if I can, Ken, there's another example in another area um, because of the mayor's focus on environmental concerns is we sued a large number of oil companies for allowing uh, their oil at the various gas stations to leak into uh, wells in Queens that contaminated the wells and would cost the city a lot of money to fix. And recently we won literally a hundred and four million dollar verdict mm -hmm. against Exxon where the jury found that Exxon had taken improper steps to guard against this and that case is on appeal but is an example both of advancing social policy and of course trying to protect the city fist. On the, def on the defense side if somebody gets into a car accident with a 
fire truck or slips on a sidewalk or is involved with any number of other uh, uh, activities, um, they sue the city, you defend the city yes. um, in, those, uh, in those cases with your team. I want to ask you though, what's the feedback loop to prevent similar occurrences in the future? I think I saw recently the police department cases, maybe they were just some sub subcategory with something like $93 million a year. Some of those you may have settled just because it was cheaper to settle them than to try them. Others where they were valid. But to the extent that an agency is costing the city money because its practices create this kind of exposure, how do you take what you learn in the lawsuits and then feed it back to the agencies to get them to do something differently? Well, that, that's a very good question, a very important one. And there's two things that are going on. Um, we're, we have a lot of data, uh, not just lawsuit data, but 311 data, 911 data, uh, CCRB reports, various things. And increasingly, what we're trying to do is get that information to the agencies. Um, and actually, this is another initiative of Def Deputy Mayor Goldsmith, and I'm working with him on it, is to now take the data, which of course now <coughs> um, also is uh, available on online, and get this into a mechanism so that, take the uh, Department of Transportation just as an example, um, you don't want to wait till the lawsuit is over to say, hey, maybe we should have put a traffic light at that particular intersection. And so we're trying to create a methodology so there's a much quicker feedback. Now the law department has created, uh, uh, under my watch, a three-person what we call risk management unit. So we take the lawsuit data and feed that back to the agency uh, promptly. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to do to prevent these lawsuits from happening. The Office of State Attorney General is in some ways the counterpart for the state government, what you are for city government in terms of, of state agencies and the, and the governor's office. They also have enforcement powers and regulatory powers in certain industries that go beyond uh, your scope. But we're going to have a new attorney general statewide. Eric Schneiderman has just won uh, a hard fought election. He is succeeding uh, two uh, larger than life political figures, Elliot Spitzer and, and Mario Cuomo. The history has, uh, the office has a great history with a couple of gaps, I, I suppose. What advice would you have for Eric Schneiderman in, in how he should approach his responsibilities, the staffing of his office, and his public um, uh, you know, responsibilities? Well, um, the most important thing is to get the best people possible to work for you. I'm blessed with an outstanding staff of both lawyers and non-lawyers. Um, there may be, as there inevitably will be, uh, some turnover at the Attorney General's office given a new, new boss. And uh, I have said to Eric, um, make sure you hire the best and the brightest regardless of political affiliation. I would s set off with that. Um, the Attorney General does have more affirmative power than the Corporation Council uh, does in certain areas, as you indicated, but still about 60 percent of that office's work is defensive. And so I think you have to do what we were just talking about, look at the data and ask yourself, how can we prevent this here, the state, from getting sued as often? What can we do to advise the agencies? How can we most efficiently handle the litigation? My thanks to Michael Cardoza, the New York City Corporation Council. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide. Send your comments and suggestions to Citywide at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or contact us at www.cuny.tv.